Hello, everybody. Hello. Just coming to say hello as the sun shines and the rain disappears. I wanted to welcome all of you to our 2023 Summer Institute. Whether you're here in person and have braved the rain or online, we're so happy to have you here with us. Tonight launches our seventh annual Summer Institute. Our theme is Reimagining Exploration. My name is Beth Gardner, and I'm the chair of the board of the College of the Atlantic. It's a big deal for a small institution like ours to bring world-class experts and cutting-edge thinkers to our campus for a week-long think tank. And we, as an institution, are so proud to share this carefully planned program with you. Key to this week's Summer Institute is our collaboration with National Geographic. This exciting partnership has brought the Summer Institute to new heights. The idea to start a Summer Institute was first hatched over a coffee many years ago between a loyal friend of the college, Judy Goldstein, and Will Thorndike, our former board chair, and without doubt, the guiding northern light of this institution. Their goal for the college was to have us think big and become a thought leader, not only here on the island, but in Maine and beyond. And so, here we are. Under the confident planning and direction of Sean Keeley, our Dean of Institutional Advancement at COA, we will spend the next week reimagining exploration. But we will take on the theme of exploration in our own unique COA way. We will discuss discoveries and pushing boundaries, but we will also lean heavily into the tension and disruption that comes alongside ex exploration. We want to understand how each of these discoveries or issues is intricately linked to us as human beings and also to the world around us. Here at COA, we call that approach to thinking human ecology. It means the vast interlinking dynamics that underpin our world. And so, welcome to our seventh annual Summer Institute. Sit back and enjoy. You have to listen to one more person talk before we get to, <laughs> to the folks here. Um, our drive to explore is part of what makes us human. You know, you go to any body of water on Mount Desert Island, um, flowing or contained, go to any hill, no matter like how high or small, and you'll find the impression of feet, footprints. We can't see a pond without walking around it, can't encounter an island without circumnavigating it, can't cross a stream without wondering its origin or where it meets the sea. Humanity also craves classification and taxonomizing, and our want for order and arrangement mean that we create these psychic geographies and boundaries in our mental universe, the cultural and natural, human and non-human, mind, body, homo sapiens, homo naledi, and so on. Exploration and classification are all derivative of our curiosity and our will to understand the world around us. This week, the seventh annual COA Summer Institute, held in collaboration with our friends at the National Geographic Society, is in part a survey of the current landscape of all of these physical and psychic geographies. And my name is Darren Collins, and I serve COA as its president. I'm also an alumnus and a proud alumnus from the class of 1992, and I'll be something of an MC across the week. And I think, although many of you know me as like easily enthused, um, I'm not sure I've ever been more totally consumed with excitement than right now. This is like everything that the College of the Atlantic is all about, culminating in one week here. But after I take a calming breath, I will say that we will have failed you if our week is only a survey. 
no matter how captivating and impressive. We would have just called it exploration, but we were very, uh, uh, very purposeful in fronting the word reimagining. And as we look backward at our cumulative history of exploring places and ideas, there can be little doubt that our motivations were largely divisive and dangerous. Exploration of the pith helmet or pork pie hat variety was nothing short of genocidal. Geographic discovery, anthropology, eugenics, the atomic bomb, questions of race, all these explorations had devastating consequences for humanity and primarily on the most disenfranchised and the most marginalized among us. Acab academic institutions like COA, research organizations like the National Geographic Society have been complicit in this. And we must both re-examine our roles and the consequences of past explorations, but also be part of a larger collaboration involving reimagining what the future of exploration could look like, and that's what this week is all about. As we look forward, we've learned that the process of exploration is complicated. It carries an enormous range of consequences. We've learned that the process is endless. Exploration hasn't stopped at the poles or at the level of atoms, and we've definitely learned that wealth and power and privilege are in no way prerequisites to discovery. It is with this sense of looking forward, reimagining, reframing exploration, that I welcome Keely Yuan, Keolu Fox, and Betsy Richards. Now, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. At this point, you could very well be asking yourselves, wow, you know, I really thought Darren would do a land acknowledgement, right? Um, before launching into the event, you know, especially given this cohort of speakers. And it's become commonplace, I think, for folks in my role to read something, describing which Native American group lived here, uh, making the note that the group was forced off the land and therefore we gather in unceded territory. That's a start, and all those things are true. But acknowledgement has become something of a pathetic post-confession Hail Mary, and I'm Catholic, wrote, <laughs> wrote an inconsequential. It's never enough just to acknowledge, and I therefore call on you not only to know that this is Wabanaki territory, but to know that as a state, Maine is actively depriving the Wabanaki of the sovereignty and their self-determination, and that each of us... So, But the call to action is that each of us should support the Abbey Museum and institutions like the Wabanaki Alliance in their work on decolonization, cultural revitalization, and tribal sovereignty. And it's my honor to introduce the relatively new and wholeheartedly spectacular <laughs> executive director of the Abbey Museum, Betsy Richards, who will be our interlocutor tonight. And Betsy has worked for more than 25 years in the realm of cultural preservation and the empowerment of Native peoples and other BIPOC communities. She herself is a member of the Cherokee Nation and become, before coming to the Abbey, worked at several different American Indian museums, the Ford Foundation, and the Opportunity Agenda, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to using communication to help move our nation forward toward a vision of justice, equity, and opportunity. So please help me open the seventh annual College of the Atlantic Summer Institute with all the sun following the rain and welcome Betsy Richards, Keely Yuan, and Keolu Fox. Thank you. Nice. OCO, Do uh, Da, Betsy Richards, Jalagi. My name is Betsy Richards. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, and I'm also the executive director and senior partner with Wabanaki Nations for the Abbey Museum. And I just want to thank Darren for uh, not only the land acknowledgement, but the call to action. It is so great to see you all here today. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Abbey. Uh, we partner 
with the, uh, the members of the Wabanaki Confederacy that are here, that are located in what we now call um, Maine. And they are the Passamaquoddy, the Penobscot, the Maliseet, and the Micmac Nations. Um, the Abbey co-stewards their heritage, and we uplift their living cultures. So they are here, um, and this is their homelands. So it's an honor to be here this evening um, with you, and it really is an honor to kick off this institute with this conversation, um, along with my esteemed guests. So um, welcome to Expanding Exploration, Indigenous Futures and Perspectives. And I just want to begin by saying, Indigenous people, uh, we live at the intersection of some of today's most pressing issues, including climate change, human rights, and bioethics. We're also survivors, and I use that word survivor very intentionally. Um, we're survivors of extractive, supremacist, and genocidal notions of discovery. Um, but today, along with our guests, Kiolu Fox and Kili Rian, both National Geographic explorers, will be diving into the themes of exploration and discovery through an indigenous lens, um, and hopefully to reframe these contexts towards the future. So my first question, um, Kiolu and Kili, uh, would you just briefly introduce yourselves and just tell us a little bit about your work? Yeah. Okay. Your um, yeah, Batsuguapo. My name is Kili Yuyen, and I am both a National Geographic photographer as well as an explorer. Um, so as a photographer, eventually I will show you some pictures, because that's always better than listening to me talk. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but you know, most of the stuff that I do is honestly, um, people look at the photography work that I do and they're like, oh, it's so full of insight, but really it's just, honestly, it's because I just happen to come from a perspective that largely has not been around for a couple of hundred years. <laughs> and um, so, but I do think that in, to a large extent, what I really do is, um, as an indigenous descendant, I spend a lot of my time around native communities of all stripes globally. And what I am trying to do is just trying to glean insights from living in, embedding myself in, being a part of trying to see the world from different indigenous perspectives, particularly my own, um, multicultural perspectives. And, and I've started to understand over time through photography, both in telling the story, you have to really understand the story itself. Um, and what I've understood is that the world is absolutely full of insight but most of those insights are now pretty much impossible to get from the box that we're in mm. as humanity these days, um, or at least in the dominant paradigm these days. What's left is that there are still tens of thousands of cultures around the world who have tons of insights and largely have been unable to express those insights. And so my job, to a large degree, is putting them in front of you all. Yeah, so that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. that's beautiful. Uh, is my thing on? Oh, okay, good. Yeah. All right, all right. All right. Yeah, yeah. Aloha, everybody. I'm Keolu Fox. I am from the big island of Hawaii. Has anyone ever been there? All right, for those of you who haven't been there, don't go. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, it's a really unique, special place. Um, I'm Kanaka Maole, and it is one of the most biodiverse places in the world as an island. I think we have like 11 out of 13 biomes on planet Earth. We get green sand beaches, pink sand beaches, black sand beaches, all of that. Elevation, um, incredible reef systems. It's a really complicated place though also because of our relationship with militarism and, and, and the tourism industrial complex. And I think that <laughs> that really informs the way we think about a lot of things. I'm from a very particular place where we have one of the largest ranches in the United States of America that you've never heard of. And um, we have been thinking about genetics in, in so many different ways for so long. Um, and my current occupation is I work as a genome scientist and I mostly focus on 
providing the fruits of precision medicine to indigenous communities and historically marginalized communities. And there are some really sensitive relationships that exist there. So a place like Big Island is not only the most bio, one of the most biologically diverse places in the world, but, but as far as human beings, the new census data is that Hawaii County, the county I'm from, is the most diverse county in America. Hmm. And that is a stark contrast to a lot of other places, like Bar Harbor, for example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think that's a really interesting distinction because when we think about painting this whole future of genomic medicine, the Human Genome Project, and all the ways that we explore those things, um, we're really only serving one community of people because the vast majority of these sequencing experiments, including the reference genome that we compare everything to, is of one community. So if we're using everybody's taxpayers' dollars mm -hmm. to do this type of research, then it should reflect the complexity and diversity that we see every day in places like Hawaii. Um, clinical trials are also really, really bad because there's a dearth of diversity there. So mm -hmm. one of the challenges that we deal with is we have communities that do not want to participate in research because of a history of exploitation. And it is really about making the process transparent and involving people as community members and partners that own their own data and this brings us to a whole new position of, a, of another new series of ideas called indigenous data sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And we could talk about that, or if you find me throughout the week, you can ask me any question you want about that. But, but that's sort of what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you're both uh, indigenous explorers, uh, but whose ancestors have mm -hmm. been on the receiving end of discovery. Uh, mm -hmm. So my question is, um, uh, could we take a moment and just talk a little bit about your values, mm -hmm. right? Your values and how they show up in your work mm -hmm. um, and, w and, you know, what you bring to your work that are based on those values. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. As oh, indigenous man. people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I appreciate you, Betsy. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's great. Um, and uh, I hope you are all ready for the fact that uh, between the three of us up here, we've opened this Pandora's box of things that are related to indigenous issues. Because when you put, uh, I think this is one of the things that people don't realize um, a lot, is that when you start talking to Native people about one particular thing or the other, it's it tends to, we talk, talk about things holistically. We talk about a whole range of things, and pretty soon you're sucked into a completely different world, and so you're living inside of a, a sci-fi alternate reality because all the things that we care about we see from a very different point of view, and it includes everything, everything. Mm -hmm. And I think um, when you're talking about values, mm. there's hugely different values. Um, but, of course, uh, it's very easy to say that... Um, we have a whole different set of values, but I also we can't say that the values are the same. Mm. Each of our communities has a very different set of values. It's basically 100,000 different human experiments throughout time, right? Um, but there are some values that don't endure very well, and we don't see them. Uh, mm. And indigenous peoples being one, the ones that have basically survived for a very long time in a place means that there are certain values that have done very well and um, have gone through many millennia. And I would say those things include the value of family, a value of the value of family and community, those kind of things go together, value for the land, and um, boy, they might just end there. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the things that mm. all bind us in this like, you know, in this the way that you sort of sort of speak about everybody. All and how does it show time. up? In yeah, the so work. how does it it's show up in the work? Um, I think when I am photographing a community, I spend a lot of time inside that community um, because you can't really tell a story. Well, I mean, you can. We certainly, I mean, even at National Geographic, we've done that for 200 years, is um, spend a lot of time telling stories from the perspective of the person who's telling the story, right? The photographer who's, or the writer that's telling the story. And for the first time in history, now we have, we now have, um, people like myself who are photographers who are able to tell a story from not necessarily inside, but we're certainly much closer to the thing that we're talking about. 
Um, but I think I could, the best way to answer this question, Betsy, is about process, yeah. you know? Mm. And <clears throat> it's not even about what we say, but how we approach going out to go say it, you know? Yeah. Um, I think at this point in time, most of us know that it's not really good to fly a photographer and writer in and drop them out of a parachute with a parachute into a community. Mm. There isn't a name for that, parachute journalism. We don't do that <laughs> anymore, really. But we do, unfortunately. But we mostly don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, for example, I was just in Australia working with the, um, some Aboriginal mobs over there. Um, Aboriginal mobs is the word for tribe that mm -hmm. they use over there. And, you know, a uh, lot of what the process is, is asking permission. And this is a whole different thing. Like, you spend months and months and months and months talking to people and getting to know elders and all of this in order to be, get to the place where you can not just ask permission, but you don't even need to ask permission. You, you at, definitely do. You definitely do ask for permission, but you don't need to because the trust is built. People understand what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, and who you are as a person, and your relationship to them, and your relationship to the things in the world around you. And so in that process, um, I don't, what I don't do, for example, maybe it's easier to put, put it this way, I don't drop into a community with five crew members who are making a film and then ask people to, to do things over and over and over for the camera, mm. right? That's like a whole different way of working. I'm not limited. Um, this is very much a, a wonderful thing that National Geographic does is that we have the ability to be in the field for months at a time and we can, s we can be there and I can spend half that time not making a photograph but instead being a human being and listening to people talk and listening to their stories and doing the things, driving elders from one place to another, doing all the things that are important to do as human beings first before being um, a person who's hired by National Geographic to do a job. And that is the, probably the most important part of it is that this process that you're talking about, the values are deeply embedded in that. Like, um, if I'm not over there helping the elders do stuff, really, what is the point? Yes. of me going there and doing any of it. So, yeah, I hope that answers some of the questions. <laughs> That's great. How does <laughs> yeah. it show up for you, Kiela? Man, um, I, I, it makes me think about something my mom says all the time. When people move to Hawaii, for example, she always says, are they here to pick fruit or are they here to plant trees? Mm. Mm. And, I, and I think, yeah, I know, wisdom. Nice. Yeah, but I think, I think that idea about like are you here to contribute are you here to be a community member first and then an individual second I think that is like quite ubiquitous amongst indigenous mm -hmm. communities it's mm -hmm. quite ubiquitous and again just to not to paraphrase what you said but the idea of like monolithing communities all as one is really really dangerous and we shouldn't do that with respect to anything yes. and certainly when we're talking about indigenous people's values cannot do that but one thing uh, sticks with me. I had an experience. I was at an Indian casino in uh, Seattle recently, outside of Seattle. And I saw a gentleman there, and he had a laptop. And I was like, you know, drinking a Crown Royal. I was like, oh, man, Excel at a time like this? What the hell? You know. <laughs> but, the, but he's, he, and I, I actually asked the guy a question. You know, he's an elder from that community. And I said, hey, what are you, what are you doing? Are you balancing the books? And he's like, yeah, I'm balancing the books, but we're doing this a little differently. So if you think about economic growth and trajectories from the quarter one, quarter two, quarter three point of view, that's a very Western way to think about growth and exponentialism and a lot of these problems and issues. And he was like, we balance the books for 10 generations in the future. So you guys see that when you go to Whole Foods and you see that like laundry detergent, seven generations or whatever, but yeah. this is the actual application of these ideas. And it's kind of like the seed of what we're talking about when we refer to indigenous futurism. It's like, what is the long-term planning and approach? That is a value. That is a value. It is not a short-term gain and position, right? And it all kind of comes back to this idea of centering and prioritizing community. Um, in our work, you know, we really think about that and reflect on positionality deeply. I mean, generally speaking, when we sequence someone's genomes, we have kind of like two trajectories that we can discuss their information. One of them is their migratory history. It is their diaspora. You, 
you are a reflection of geographic sequestration over time, we are no different from Darwin's finches in that sense. When we talk about indigenous people, like high elevation in Tibet and Nepal, those communities are a reflection of living in that environment, and their genome has been impacted by that over 8,000 years. When we talk about our island hopping and being the best sailors in the world, non-negotiable. You call that an ocean? Come on. But, uh, but <clears throat> that, 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 that has an impact on our genome. It, it affects everything. When we interact with other communities, colonialism itself, when you have a population collapse, that shapes the immune systems of modern day people. Okay, so we're now we're getting into this. It's either medical actionability and impact or your actual identity, the foundation of people's identity. So you have to be very careful when you're returning that type of information because it literally uh, is, is impacting someone's value system. And it's, you have to be cautious. Um, but one thing that I've not done um, is really work in other communities that I'm not a part of. I wouldn't interpret people's genomes that I'm, I'm, I'm not a part of that community, and, and we call that positionality, critical scholars do. But I think, for the most part, you wanna help people build mm -hmm. capacity and infrastructure so that they can do their own research, right? Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's a departure from the status quo. Thank you for that, yeah. Um, I, loved, I loved the piece of wisdom that I think people talk about mm -hmm regenerative forestry and regenerative <laughs> agriculture, but what we're really talking about is this really actually matters for indigenous people too, of this uh, reciprocity and giving back as well as extracting. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanna move on to discussing, you know, kind of the, the mindsets and narrative around all this stuff too. Um, you know, we all know that the organizations, the government, um, research institutions, they've done a lot of sidestepping of rights, um, particularly for indigenous peoples um, in, in pursuit of exploration. So um, when you're coming up against partners or folks that have hired you, not necessarily National Geographic, but maybe mm. National Geographic or others, um, where, what would you say is the challenge of what needs to change in their mindsets? How would you flip the script on their work, not only in involving First Peoples, but just human subjects in general? Um, what in the, in the thinking, in the, in the approach? Mm. And I think you've talked about it a little bit, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still just kind of reeling from this wonderful thing that Kaylee just said, which is, do you show up for community first and as, if, and as an individual second? I, I just love that. So just, just to repeat it. Just <laughs> yeah. um, so yes, I very much, the, the idea of flipping the script on the exploration, I think is something, um, Betsy and I spoke about this uh, <laughs> er, earlier as well, but I think it's honestly, um, it's a sort of no-brainer for me. I am, I, the work that I do, especially the work the lar very large in National Geographic Society supported grant story that I'm working on right now, is all about this idea of flipping the script. And um, I actually prepped some keynote slides for you guys to actually see because it's so easy to talk about the stuff in the abstract. It's so much easier to talk about real on the ground, you know? So I'm gonna show you some pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. So, for you, Kealu. We start with the Pacific <laughs> uh, in Palau. Ooh. And so nice. this story that I'm working on is about indigenous stewardship. So the idea of changing exploration, obviously I want to flip it around and look at it like innovation or this thing that Kaylu mentioned before, um, indigenous futurism, basically is essentially saying uh, the real innovation that happens in the world at this point in time, like true groundbreaking, like paradigm shifting kind of uh, mind mindset changes is not going to come from within the dominant paradigm anymore. They might, it, yes, every once in a while, every couple hundred years, there will be a major thing that will happen of some kind. But right now, there's still tens of thousands of communities out there that have extremely different perspectives and mindsets who 
have a lot to offer. Um, and land stewardship is probably the, probably the tip of the iceberg, but it's also one of the most important and most easily visible because the proof is in the pudding. When you look around at any place that's really beautiful and pristine today, you can pretty much say, well, that happened because indigenous people kept it that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, people think of it as like, oh, human beings left it alone. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> John Muir, I mean, wrong. Yeah, exactly. No, Definitely no. John Muir, wrong. No, like when I was a young, when I was a young person, getting just, just starting to become aware of indigenous issues more than just like outside of my own existence in my family, one of the books I came across was this wonderful book called uh, 1491 by mm -hmm. Charles Mann, who I've had the fortune to work with as a writer on a story. And um, it blew my mind because you basically started talking about all of the Americas as being completely, um, completely managed, right? The Amazon rainforest is managed by fire. There's not just any portion of it that is untouched. Today, it's become a tangled mess because fire doesn't exist anymore because humans aren't burning. Australia might be the most managed landscape in the world, and we will talk about that. But in terms of land management, I'm, I'm going to go to Palau first because Palau is the place where we get, where Westerners understand it the easiest. When you look at a place like this, you see beautiful uh, mangroves and mm -hmm. lagoons like this, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Rock Islands. If you're a diver, you've probably at least heard of Palau. If you're not a diver, you've probably never heard of it. <laughs> 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 but it's got one of the largest marine protected areas in the world, and it is, was the first country on Earth to declare marine sanctuary. Palau is also an indigenous majority country. Wow. And um, so a lot of the values of, of its traditional system are embedded in the way that it governs and, and um, does things. And so um, it has some of the healthiest coral reefs in the world in some of the hottest water in the world. Mm. How is this possible? Yes, the coral gets bleached there just like it does anywhere else. But the difference is the coral is extremely resilient. It bounces back in just a couple of years. This reef that you're looking at right now was bleached just two years prior. So what you're seeing is the coral bounces back incredibly fast, and according to the Scripps Oceanographic Institute, who I was there with on this trip, um, diving in Helen Reef, this happens because the fishery is extremely healthy. The fish eat the algae that keep the coral from regenerating. They're resilient unless mm -hmm. you keep your boot heel on top of it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That sounds familiar. It should. Um, mm -hmm. There's also storytelling that is going on. Palauans have this tradition of stories that is so powerful and important to them that it's in every hotel, it's in every restaurant, wow. every person's wall has got like a wall hanging with this mm -hmm. story, the story of the breadfruit tree, which is essentially, I'm going to tell you the story, although I'll Jeez. make it very condensed. An old woman, an elder, was in her village in Palau and then um, wasn't being treated very well by the villagers. No one was giving her fish to eat. She was just sort of just slowly starving to death. Her, her son comes to visit, sees this terrible state of affairs and goes to the breadfruit tree growing by her house, cuts off a limb and the whole sea starts pouring out. So she just puts the basket underneath the, the, the hole and catches fish to eat. Mm -hmm. But the villagers get jealous thinking, oh, well, we have to do all this work to catch the fish. So they decide in the middle of the night to sneak into the, sneak it to the breadfruit tree and cut it down so they get all the fish. <laughs> and the sea comes pouring out of the tree and floods the village and everyone dies. So uh, native stories are not like <laughs> <laughs> the Disney-fied stories. <laughs> they're, they're, they're a little darker sometimes, <laughs> but we love that. <laughs> and um, this story is a reminder. Every Palauan knows this story inside and out, right? So this is a thing that they have remind themselves about. The other thing is governance. One of the things that we don't talk about, we don't have very much in the way of, of um, real exploration in terms of governance, right? The, the kind of governance, the reason the Palau's democratic institutions work so well is because they mimic the traditional systems. And the traditional system uh, for managing the fisheries is, oh, the chief hears from their cousin, oh, there's not enough groupers over here. What am mm. I? So the chief goes out, goes fishing because they're fishermen too. <laughs> Local regional chief, right, goes out fishing, dives down there in the reef, going to look for, you know, spear fishing. There's not enough groupers. So he shuts that place down. But when that place closes, the, the neighboring region that was closed before opens. 
when one place closes and the other place opens and every reef is divided into multiple sections so that happens. Mm. And when the chief makes that decision, everyone trusts them because that whole system is built up in such a way where trust is built into the system. All the checks and balances are there. And at the end of the day, women have the final say in who stays in power and who does not. Important part of it. Mm. I would like to point out that the United States government is built on the Haudenosaunee model. Uh, it is built on um, what formerly known as Iroquois. Um, and the Haudenosaunee model has made it possible for a representative democracy to exist throughout the world. It came from this region of the world, from this general area. And what the one thing, though, that the founders left out was the final layer of checks and balances in the Haudenosaunee system, which is called the clan mothers. And the clan mothers have the ultimate veto power. They don't create any legislation, don't create any policy, but the clan mothers have the ability to remove any legislator who they think is corrupt or who they think is... In, you know. That'd be nice. That'd Wouldn't be that nice. be useful? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. But the Palauans, you know, they had a beautiful thing going on, and protecting their traditional culture is very important to them because when they fight for their reef, they're fighting for the fish, but they're fighting for these guys. Right? They're, th they're thinking of this when they see that, when they're thinking of that. Okay, so now I'm going to go to something completely different, which is in Greenland, very different to the Western way of thinking. They have some of the most healthy marine mammal populations on the planet. They don't have the Marine Mam Mammal Protection Act. They don't need the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Over here, they hunt narwhals, but they have lots of narwhals. And it, part of how this is done is because they have a very powerful traditional management system. And a big part of that includes mm. hunting by kayak. Mm. So kayak hunting is done with harpoon. You throw it, and um, that thing that looks like the Pokemon at the back of the boat there, <laughs> that is actually a float that keeps the narwhal from going down. But um, the traditional system is extremely important to them because they understand um, that when you hunt using the traditional system, you don't take too many narwhals, and also you are constantly observing the narwhals, right? The reason why when scientists go to Greenland to study narwhals, they always talk to the hunters is, guess who knows everything about the narwhals? The hunters. Mm. The other thing that happens is the primary form of transportation in Kanak, Greenland, in North Greenland, is dog sled. Mm -hmm. When you talk to the hunters about this, they don't want to go to fishing because when they go to fishing, in order for them to haul their catch back, that requires snow machines. And I've never heard this in any other place expressed so well, but they say, if I, if I have buy a snow machine to bring the fish back so I can sell the fish, then that means I have to be part of the monetary economy and I have to hunt so many narwhals in order to pay for that snow machine, or I have to catch so many fish, what is left for me when I get that snow machine back, right? And um, this is the same idea. When we go out seal hunting, we feed all the dogs, we feed ourselves with a single seal. So we can travel 50 kilometers back and forth across the sea ice and feed the dogs with catching a single seal. There's no petroleum involved. There's no other resources involved. If you look at the place, there's not really any other things out there, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But it's a really, really lovely place, and traveling around by dog sled, I would just venture to say that uh, is f f way better than traveling by mechanized transport. It just is. Look at it. Um, okay, and yeah, clothing, tradition, all of this is really important. For the Greenlanders, they are not thinking about preserving the environment in a way like, let's preserve, the, let's preserve this place and freeze it in time so that it never changes. What they're thinking is, we want to preserve our culture, and we want to make sure that the things that are important to us do not vanish. And in that process, they're taking care of the place. Right, that's that traditional management system. If you want to know more about it, um, it will be coming, the story will be coming out August 2024, 2024, yes. yeah, that's next Ooh. year. Um, and also just because I know you guys want to see some narwhals. Oh, yeah. yeah I do. I love it. There they are. Oh. Oh. Beautiful. And uh, they're just about to dive under some young sea ice there. So you can see how lovely that is. Mm. Um, also, I'd like to point out this footage is shot by uh, Ulanak, who is um, who was the second assistant on this story, which is part of the National Geographic Society uh, effort to um, put indigenous um, uh, media and have them mentored on, on assignment with the National Geographic photographer, in this case, me. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so then we're going to look at Ecuador. These guys, um, the Kofan, have been fighting big oil in Latin America for longer than anybody. 
this is their land. Mm -hmm. The most, so Coyote's talking about biodiversity. His place has a lot of biodiversity, mm -hmm. but it's not, <laughs> sorry, man. <laughs> but it's not quite as much as it is because the Chicago Field Museum tells us that this portion of Ecuador in the Amazon rainforest has the high biodiversity in the world. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to point out that um, this is what is threatening that. That is 30 kilometers in every direction that you can see of palm oil. Mm -hmm. That was once Amazon rainforest. This is just outside the borders at the Kofan lands. When you look at a satellite map of the Amazon, what you see is deforestation out right up to the edge of indigenous lands and then no more. Um, and the way they do this is they appoint a, they choose a very young person, the Kofan find a young person, the least selfish young person, hmm. and they basically say, I'm sorry, man, but we're having, not gonna have to do this to you, but you have to go <laughs> to the capital city and learn Spanish. You can't hunt and fish anymore. You have to serve your people. <laughs> and Ugo did not want to do this. Let me tell you, he did not like this. And then after he went to Quito and learned Spanish, then he went to the United States he learned English, he went to Brown University, got his degree, he's currently a PhD candidate. Oh. And everyone said when they got to America that he would never want to leave it. He wouldn't want to leave the cars behind and all the fancy stuff that the modern world has for him. He immediately, after graduating, <laughs> went back to his homeland, driving elders around. Every single day that we're on assignment, we'd go and we would drive an elder from one place to another. We'd pick up people hauling bananas around or whatever. You know, and Ugo is really important because he knows how to speak the language of the colonial world. So he's able to fight for land title. Mm -hmm. He's able to enlist lawyers and he's able to do all the things that the outside world needs in order for him to, for his people to be able to protect their land. And they do a very good job of it, including these just kind of ridiculous things that they have to do, like carve a border around their entire homeland, which is uh, a semi-truck in width through the entire jungle. Their land is enormous. It's one and a half times the size of Yosemite National Park. Mm. It has higher biodiversity, which is obvious because it's in the tropics, but it's a huge place. And I would like to point out the Kofan steward this pristine piece of the Amazon rainforest, which has more threats by far than Yosemite, and they do it on $30,000 a year. Yosemite National Park cost $33 million a year to keep pristine. That difference in cost, $32 million, is the price that you pay to have wilderness without people in it. Mm -hmm. And finally, Australia. This is an Australian rainforest, really beautiful place, um, northwest in Queensland. Um, and this is a cassowary, and that little muppet down there is a <laughs> cassowary chick oh. that is, um, you can see in its mouth, it's got a thing called the kwandong berry or a cassowary berry. The qua cassowaries are important because they, without them, the rainforest would basically lose 150 different species. They are required in order for those species to propagate, otherwise the fruit falls straight down and the, those trees, those plants can't survive, really. The rainforest takes over. They're considered a keystone species. Any museum you go to in that area will say, cassowary, this is a keystone species. But I find it really interesting because Australians will never talk about human beings as a keystone species. But you're about to find out why that's, a, that's a silly. Because Aboriginal peoples have been maintaining their landscape with fire, intentional burning for at least 13,000 years and possibly as long as 35,000 years. When you t look at a soil sample, you can look at in the ground and you can see the soil is black. And then there's a tiny little strip mm. of red. That red means this is the time when settlers first appeared and stopped Aboriginal people from burning the land. That's how long the burning has been for. And without that burning, species like cassowaries have a really hard time surviving. They need it. People, the people have been burning there so long that there is more there are more species than that cassowary propagates that require anthropogenic fire. They require mm. fire in order to survive. They've evolved alongside human fire, right? So this is an amazing thing when you think about it. Look at the termites here, for example. Termites have obviously been around for longer than humans have, but nonetheless, they're a species that's evolved to require fire. They do much better when there's fire around, and that fire is used to create zones of that's not just rainforest. You don't want this dense, tangled rainforest, because when you go inside of a dense, tangled rainforest, all that's in there 
is just, it's like silent. If you've ever gone to a real dense rainforest, it's silent. There's not hardly anything inside of it. You go to the edge where the road is, where when you drive around, when you see things like cassowaries, you see eagles, you see creatures wandering around, you see whatever, a crocodile wa- crossing the, the road. I don't know why it would do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, why are they there? They're there because it's a transition zone. They need those open areas that Aboriginal people create. And look at these guys. They're heroes, right? Just cool. amazing people, and they continue to burn. And I would like to point out that, like the Kofan, um, like all of these people that are doing all of this work on the land in order to make it a better place, in order to keep it stewarded, like the Greenlanders who make their hunting restrictions harder on themselves, they make it harder to do the things that they need, they do it because they love their place and they consider it to be important. That's why they do it. So anyway, th- that is the reason. When, it, when talking about flipping exploration, that is what it is that I'm talking about. Like, there's all of this innovation that has happened and is continuing to happen, right? A lot of the stuff is modern, like sending Ugo to the capital to learn. That is a modern adaptation of something that's very important to do. So anyway, my very long-winded answer, but at least Thank if I show you, you picks here. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. All right. Flipping the script. Maestro. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah sorry. I made you guys some slides. <clears throat> They're not as pretty as his, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so. What do all these things have in common? Oh, I think you just popped oh, yeah. out. Oh, no. Maybe I turned it off or something. No. How about now? Yeah. Ah, perfect. Uh. Okay. These are all resources. Water, oil, rare earth minerals timber, they're very, very valuable. They're very contentious, right? And what, one of the things that we really try to do in our Indigenous Futures Institute and a lot of the organizations that we build is we really try to educate our communities on the fact that data is a resource. How many people have made that association before? Okay, all right, well, you're, you know, come on, you're an astrophysicist, brother. <laughs> all right, all right, I'm just saying. It is a resource. It is very important that we couch it and think about it that way. I've worked in data mining as a process, as a genome scientist, for over a decade before I ever connected the word mining with any other resource. It's really important. And when we think about human genome sequencing and the way that it's extremely valuable, it's commodified, we have this, um, this is a very like very generous way of referring to our healthcare system as creaky. That's what Barack Obama said. I would say that it's just like designed that way and extremely corrupt and broken. But genomic information is extremely valuable now. And we have all kinds of issues that are broken in our supply chain. So one of the fun things we like to do is use things like mid-journey, for example, to generate deep fakes of things that should happen, okay? Who saw the images of um, Trump in prison working out and stuff? <laughs> They're a pretty funny application of deep fakes and artificial intelligence technology. So we made a few that we thought were pretty funny. And this is Tim Cook visiting a cobalt <laughs> mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This has never happened, <laughs> ever. We are all reliant on this material, Love okay? It. We are all reliant on cobalt in the laptops we use, um, integrated circuits. Uh, anything that you can think of, this is a central and important resource. However, the communities that live there, uh, I would say that this is the most broken supply chain in the world. They, uh, many of them are inhaling toxic dust. Many of them are, uh, you know, digging with their bare hands only to have these artisanal mines collapse on them um, and die. And all of that is so that we can, um, you know, send emails and use the internet of things and all of these types of things. So this is sort of the power of what we can do with m- many of these things to create imagery, to do things like this. W- what we don't want to see with our supply chain when it comes to DNA, human DNA, is it recapitulate these really broken relationships. Um, and this is a bunch, uh, a photo that I took at Illumina, their headquarters. Has anyone ever heard of Illumina? No? Maybe a few of you guys. This is one of the largest biotech companies in the world. 
they are responsible for a lot of the technologies that we use, the hardware and the algorithms that we develop. Um, and they have put all of these patents on their wall. And this is in their dining room, okay? And it looks like a bunch of moose heads in a hunting lodge. They're proud of this. They're proud that they've created IP and they've commodified sequencing <laughs> data, okay? It's a strange relationship. We have to flip that on its head. We have to think about why this is problematic sometimes and what it leads to. Um, and so we know that data is extremely valuable. We want our community members to really think about this and have uh, you know, hands on access. So one of the most recent things we did is we built, uh, in collaboration with another company called NVIDIA, a small edge computing facility or a little mini cloud in a bank. And so I just want you guys to listen carefully. Uh, not to me panting, but. Yeah. So you can hear the hum coming off. Has anybody ever been in a data center before? Okay, okay. It's hot in there. It's hot because generating data is not independent of the second law of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, these are just a few other things. Um, I wanted to, I don't have photos of, you know, <laughs> taking people's blood. Or, that's like extremely inappropriate, obviously. Yes. But just <laughs> saying that there's a premium on grassroots research and community-based research and democratizing technology and access. That's my friend Hayden Henry. He's doing his first PCR. He's a huge Maori dude, yeah. and he doesn't fit into an XXL size lab coat. <laughs> and the faces of people that do science in these different ways are very different in indigenous genomics. Um, these are some of the tools that we like to play around with. These are what we would call point of care technologies. One of these was developed at Scripps Institute for Oceanography. It collects all kinds of data. Obviously, I'm a walking stereotype, love surfing. And <laughs> it's a great way for us to involve people in community-based data collection. Um, so is mobile PCR and mobile genome sequencing, which has recently become in vogue. Um, and this is a mobile ultrasound. And these are ways for us to de-black box the technologies we, de we use. People are scared of hospitals. They don't like walking in there, mm -hmm. into the medical industrial complex. But bringing tools into indigenous spaces is flipping it the other way around. Uh, this is just us using this really cool myoton thing, uh, doing a large gout study in Tahiti. And thinking about that and taking that to the next level and saying, well, why aren't we build, why are we forcing all these communities to outsource their genomes to places like Boston and La Jolla and Seattle? Why aren't we building community and facilities locally in shipping containers and geodesic domes, things that are easily shippable and we take advantage of the supply chains that already exist? That's um, exactly what we're doing with a lot of our infrastructure, and this is in Hawaii. Um, and thinking about and prioritizing vertical integration. So you can, uh, you mm -hmm. can innovate horizontally Sometimes across yeah. institutions, but building your own things worked really well for Henry Ford. And it worked really well for Amazon.com, who will literally send a truck to your location to collect your data because they know that it is the most valuable asset and commodity on planet Earth, surpassing oil in 2018. That's why we started the Native Biodata Consortia, the first genome sequencing center and research facility on our reservation in US history. These are some of my partners. They're amazing people. Um, and we've been exploring the development of our own cloud and computation systems, because guess what? Our communities don't want to store their genomes on Amazon Web Services. Mm -hmm. They don't trust them. <clears throat> and those are just some, some of those names. Um, however, I showed you that little video of the bank because what we are anticipating and what I want everyone to remember is we're having these conversations about how toxic combustion engines are for producing CO2 and greenhouse gases and, and it's not looking good, okay? Climate change is here. It's not going anywhere. We have to rapidly innovate. Everything has to go well all at once. And we have an addiction to oil. 
but we also have an addiction to data. Simultaneously, and the production of data, the storage of it, produces heat. Mm. And we all have to be responsible for that. What does that mean? Are we going to hold Amazon Web Services just to pick on them? Google, Microsoft, all of them responsible when they say they're creating carbon offset markets? Or are we going to innovate in new directions and say, there are al alternatives to that. There are ways to move forward with Earth-friendly computation. And one of our favorite ways to do this is by storing data in the genomes of things. Okay, and maybe that sounds like a crazy ass idea because <laughs> all the best ones are. But this is a paper that came out in 2017 and it's showing the, oh man, what's that, this horse video called? I can never remember. It was in a Jordan Peele movie. But this is the, one of the first videos ever and it's broken down frame by frame. Oh, and the Moy Bridge? Moy Bridge, yeah, thank you, right. thank that's God. Right. Yeah, yeah. Moy Bridge. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's broken down frame by frame. <laughs> pixel by pixel, and those pixels correspond to zeros and ones, and those zeros and ones can be converted to in a codex to A, G, Cs, and Ts. And this video, frame by frame, was stored in an E. coli cell. So that means we can store data in genomes, because that's what they do. And then on the right, we are exploring, funny you mentioned ulu and breadfruit, we're exploring ways to store data in photosynthesizing plants because they produce oxygen simultaneously. They photosynthesize. And so how can you force these giant companies to include and consider alternatives for data storage that use different methods? Maybe we do this in bioreactors. Maybe we do this in plants that remediate soil. But all of these ideas come from a position of indigenous futurism mm -hmm. because we got into arguments about we don't want to store data with Amazon Web Services, so we want our land back. What are we going to do with our land? We can't just erect some huge data center and We're be a mirror image of extractive capitalism. We have to alter, we have, we have to come up with new ideas. Anyway, so I just wanted to kind of expose you to some of the things that we're working on. Happy to answer any questions about that yeah. stuff too. And we're about ready to take some questions, but I just want to, um, because we have this whole group of people here, mm. uh, just like for one minute each maybe, mm. is there anything that these folks can do differently as far besides just no? <laughs> <laughs> Pass on information. Um, if you had a call to action. Um, I would say the... I, I thought about this, uh, or rather, I think about this in two ways. There's two ways uh, where it's easier to be involved in all this stuff. Number one is you run across things that relate to indigenous peoples all the time. All the time. It happens everywhere. And I would say the problem is, is that mostly, like everything else in media, you kind of just hit it and you run across it and then it's done. It's like just breadth all the time. Very short attention span, bits of things. I would say run it. Next time you run into something that is related to something indigenous, just do a deep dive and find out a little bit more about it because you'll discover that the world opens up really dramatically. You know, um, for example, even just like something as simple as like a totem pole. You know, if you find out, um, where was I recently? I was in Sydney, mm -hmm. Australia, and there was a totem pole from clearly from the Northwest Coast. <laughs> I was like, what is this doing here? <laughs> <laughs> right? What is the story behind it? You know, and. I didn't have to, to ask very much to realize, yes, it was a gift from a Northwest, from, from Haida. But you know, you start, as you start going down this chain of like events that led to this tonus pole being here, you discover all of this interesting information that is happening. What is the story of the tonus pole? How did it get there? Why was it a gift? Um, what was all this conversation about, you know? But then the other possibility is, um, aside from just doing that, that's a really nice, easy way to go, go about it if you're interested in this stuff. The other one is, Make a friend who is indigenous. This is really, this one is harder, definitely, because we're but encased in our own little social circles. <laughs> but you know what? We're around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're around. Go on indigenous TikTok, you know, yeah. and say hi to some of the people on there. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any uh, things that folks can do? Yeah, I'll be brief. But we have this saying in Hawaii, yeah. it means walk backwards into the future. It just means recognize when 
mistakes were made in the past and <laughs> how do we learn from our ancestors? I think it's a really good way to um, move forward and, and realize that maybe expertise can come from all different walks of life just because somebody is in a card carrying PhD having scientist doesn't mean that they don't have really good insights into the things that they're, they're building. Um, and I would just really, really consider that and, you know, and, and vote and read more. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know read different authors. Yeah. Look at the things you're reading right now. Like, who's writing them? You know, and, you know, explore alternatives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think we are now in the period where we're going to take some questions from the audience. Um, and Sean uh, from the college is going to be, he's got the microphone. All right, I got the mic. Who, who needs it? Right here. Hi. Um, I, I wondered what is your definition of data? That's a good question. <laughs> oh, what, the question was, what is my definition of data? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, pretty much anything. So I hope that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I would say, you know, just to elaborate on that a little more, I think it's very clear what we mean when we're talking about zeros and ones. But I also think like... Um, when, you know, there's all these stereotypes about like, oh, Hawaiian people have a thousand ways to describe rain or, you know, <laughs> and, and yes, we do. <laughs> but also those insights are data. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's really important. And the way that it's documented and stored makes it data. And you will see more creative uses and utilizations now that we are in the machine intelligence era. You will, you will see all the types of different ways that we're tr training algorithms using untraditional forms of data over the next few decades. I can promise you that. Yeah, that was a good question. Good question, good question. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great, great presentation, uh, Andy Revkin. And uh, I guess my question is for Kiolo. Kiolo, how do you pronounce your name? Sorry? He wants to know how to pronounce your, your first name. Oh, Keolu. Keolu. Mm -hmm. um, you brought up a really important thing about the diversity within indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a journalist. I spent 40 years trying to understand the question of who speaks for an indigenous community. If you go to, <laughs> uh, go to the North Slope of Alaska, there are many views within mm. the indigenous community there about oil, about everything, tradition, snow machines. And, and if you, in the Amazon, there are tribes on the, on the border of the Amazon who are uh, making deals with soy farmers on their land, and they should have that right to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So th how, how does the non-indigenous community grapple with that, uh, the importance of diversity? How do you understand, and then who do you listen to? How do you make those choices? Uh, what's, is there, is there something to think question. about there? Yeah. For, for both of you, or actually all three of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> this is a very good question, actually. I love this question. Uh, it's actually a very informed uh, question. Um, yeah, so I think we are trying to get at basically is that Native peoples don't all agree about the things that is that we do. And I think this is one of the hardest points because we, uh, as a society, like the globally dominant society really likes to be able to have conversations with individuals and to be able to take what an individual says and be able to argue it point by point, you know, to have this sort of like sort of logical head battle about these things. But you kind of have to break it down this way. Um, as Native people, we're much more concerned about what our community says in the broader sense. You want to look at it in terms of like zooming out. What is, what is the most of the voice saying? We're like any other people, we're basically like a distribution, right? We, we're like a bell curve, we're a distribution of a kind. But just like anything else that has a bell curve, there's a dominant, th there's a dominant message that comes out of it, you know? Where is most of that bell curve? Yeah, there are, are going to be people on the North Slope who are saying, let's sell all of it, let's sell all of it, let's Money. get the max dollar for it. Um, 
And, but when you start to really pay attention and start to listening to many different voices, especially uh, leaders' voices, you start to see that there are very distinct things that come out of it. It's not, uh, and the message isn't necessarily like, um, the message is complicated and it's broken down into multiple things. Like on the North Slope, the question of oil is broken down into people really care about whales and they don't want to see whale, whaling or whales disrupted but they also want to see that their way of life, uh, that they have sovereignty and that they have the ability to live their life uninterrupted by colonial interests, which is, so that means they need to get, make, keep the amount of money that they're making rolling in. And so they're very interested in finding ways to keep that self-sufficiency, keep their, the amount of power and influence that they have, which means finding oil, uh, keeping oil money flowing in in some way or other. So there are all these sort of competing interests, but what you see by and large when you start to listen, I, I'm sure you've already encountered this, but when you really listen, you start to hear these different messages that appear, no matter who it is that's saying them, over time you can average it out and you will see that there are particular messages that come out. So it's not a question of talking to individuals, and this is where when you get into weird stuff like Sky News in Australia, for example, or um, I don't know, the conservative uh, news outlets they particularly love to do this, but everyone loves to do this. All media outlets like to do this. We like to take one person and have them exemplify everything else. And that is yeah. just not how native communities work. Yeah. I'm sorry. We can't uh, agree on anything. <laughs> no, but we do have, but that's the power of it too. The uh, fundamental threads that run our cultures, that's what's speaking. The culture is speaking through us. It's not what one person's harebrained idea is. That is, that is what's really, um, you know, it's, it's really like the message. Yeah. I'd like to um, yeah. add on that because mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you how something that we think about at the Abbey Museum. Um, I think one of the things people don't understand is that um, the, the, the tribal uh, folks in the United States were nations, right? We're not just yeah. collectives of folks. Um, and mostly indigenous people around the world are, sometimes they're not recognized as such, mm. but they are. Um, and so, uh, and you have all these examples of folks who are like, you go to a camp that has some completely offensive indigenous name, um, <laughs> and they say, well, how did you get that? <laughs> oh, well, a Mohawk gentleman named Joe Smith in 1923 told us it was okay to use this name. Um, great example of the <laughs> yeah. of this like let's go to the individual and ask them what not that you know I we're all against the Joe Smiths of this world uh, how it plays out at the Abbey Museum is that we have Wabanaki citizens we have a, a majority of Wabanaki citizens on our governing board but we also have a second um, uh, piece of governance of the museum and that is our Wabanaki Council. Mm. And that is made up of folks that represent the governments <laughs> um, that actually mm. have, uh, that are in touch, that are either tribal leaders or have been appointed by their tribal leaders to be in that role. Um, so it's a very different thing. Um, and we're really proud of that at the Abbey um, that what we've put in there is that kind of consultation, not just with a group of citizens, uh, but a, s a second layer of consultation actually with the nations. What they said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, add, I, I'll add just the experience I had. I think like what, just the idea of building consensus is really important, and obviously that can get complicated quickly. But I met this one guy uh, once, and they work in like island biodiversity management stuff. People love testing things in islands, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, from a bombs Game to <laughs> yeah, what you know? Come on. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and this guy is like, I don't want to take this this project and ask questions in like a town hall setting. It's the easiest way to kill my project. So. If people are bringing that intentionality into, you know, any sort of research relationship, it's clear they have a conflict of interest and, you know, be mindful of, of those types of characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe one more, Betsy. 
Excuse me? Yep. Uh, one more question we have time for. Aloha. Aloha, doctor. Yep. So um, as a card-carrying uh, PhD, I wanted to ask a question. <laughs> 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 I love you, brother. I love you. you we go, uh, Kreolu and I go way back. Yeah. No, so I guess the question I have, and, and just listening to uh, the stories that you, you told and, and all this, right, and recognizing that, uh, you know, as you said it, the, the innovation that we seek to save, you know, spaceship Earth isn't yeah. going to come from just outside of these communities, but these, you know, 10,000 or so different perspectives. And so my question to you is, do the people, from your own experiences, do the people in these communities recognize that they are being held hostage by decisions that they're not being included in, and because of globalization, the, the, the accelerated effect of unintended consequences of the des these decisions are outpacing their ability to keep up with the environment, and are they desiring to share their perspectives globally in an effort for people to understand and be able to attune and achieve this attunement? Do you feel that they're willing to share these things? So this, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just jumping in. Get them. Yeah. Yeah. This, <laughs> this is an excellent question and actually something I kind of forgot uh, to address earlier, but I'm going to answer the second part, your second part of your question, which is, do all of these communities want to share their innovation? And I would say um, it's, I'm going to just completely say that uh, some do and some don't, but that's kind of beside the point. The, the most important thing is to realize that these, a lot of these innovations cannot be stripped of their context. Mm -hmm. Like, you simply cannot pull uh, something like cultural fire, which people really want to do. They want to be like, oh, ca in California, they're like, hey, California tribes are burning. This is so cool. Let's just take this and have the Forest Service do it after the Forest Service has suppressed fire for 100 years, you know? Yeah. And the Forest Service is trying to do it and making a fairly large mess of it, as usual. But, you know, like, the thing is, what, we, what do, people don't realize is that you can't do it that way. There's a lot that goes into it, and there's a lot of stuff that's subtle and nuanced, and also it's intellectual property. Mm. It belongs to somebody else, and you can't just take it and run away with it. Like, we, yeah, we live in this very free society where we believe we could just do whatever the hell we want to. Native nations, the vast majority of the world's cultures on this planet do not believe this. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's a great thing. Um, Instead, what, what does work though, what we see time and time again works really well, so instead of stripping the technology or innovation from a people, you just empower that people to do the job. Because suddenly you have uh, or, or a, a nation with organizations and manpower and vested interest in doing a really good job at something, and they're often already doing the job already. They're typically already doing that particular job already, and all they need is a little bit of support because, let's face it, most a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve or that these technologies or innovations might be solving are getting harder every single day. Like, when you're trying to fight big oil, yeah, we fought it since the 1950s or whatever it is, but it's really hard to fight today. Like, compared to back in 1950, it was much easier. Today, very, very difficult um, to do. So just empower the communities. I was, that would be my answer to that portion of it. And now I've completely forgotten the first part of the question, but <laughs> I like I did. <laughs> it's a good question, Professor. I would say yeah. that they do know they're being held hostage. And uh, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. and um, I, I'll use an example. And it's the, is everyone familiar with the 30 meter telescope and what's going on <sighs> on top of Mauna Kea? Okay, I know you, I mean, again, yeah. astrophysicist. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> but, but I, it's interesting because the way that is presented, they want to, uh, we have all of these telescopes, they're on top of Mauna Kea, there's 13 of them, many of them are defunct, they're not creating uh, valuable data in the way that they have in the past, that's okay. My current employer, University of California system, is responsible for this, University of Hawaii, Harvard, the Smithsonian Institution, um, and the way it's presented in the media is that it's culture versus science. And that Hawaiian people <laughs> yeah. don't want this because uh, we, we're concerned, well, we have con huge concerns about the fact that we bury our ancestors there. Oh, my mic is off again. 
Oh my gosh. <sighs> that butt. I know. <laughs> 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 yeah. Right. So we have this issue where we have this issue where it's this this, this juxtaposition. The media loves this. They're like it's science versus culture, and these this is progress, right? Progress is de peering deeper into the universe, and and yes, it is, right? Yes. Um, you know, but at what cost? And if it's the affecting our water table and access to the largest aquifer on the island, if it's, if it's the relationship that we've had, we've opposed every single one of these in principle, but it's about, well, maybe you need to take your rubbish down before we let you build something new, right? Maybe you need to manage the situation and think about it and say, hey, look, waste is a luxury. You know, please take care of this. And maybe we need to educate more Native Hawaiian astrophysicists so they can occupy our interests on both sides. And um, I think I think it's a really interesting example of exactly what you're saying. And and um, I think that the media is just really responsible for some horrible narratives and storytelling, often, oftentimes. But I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Betsy, uh, Keolu and Keeley, thank you. I, I can't imagine a better way to start the week, even with the rain. There are many rains. <laughs> if those of you who were here last year might remember it happened exactly the same time, 5 p.m. on Monday. I also want to give a shout out to my great friend, Will Thorndike, who's watching from afar. Hello, Will. Um, yeah. Hey, Will. Hello, Will. <laughs> and um, so this is what I ask. Um, tomorrow we're back at 9 and we're going to go from telescope to microscope. We're going to be looking at viruses Ooh. with Dr. Nirav Shah and Nadia Rosenthal, 9 o'clock. But right now we're going to wander up to the Newland Gardens, which is up by the, on the red bricks by the Gates Auditorium. <laughs> we're going to go have a drink, so let, these, <laughs> let, the, <laughs> let the folks get up there first so we can all get up and enjoy a cocktail together. And thank you, everyone, for coming to our first evening of the Summer Institute. See you soon. Yep. Thank you.